All right, welcome to a, another episode of The Lonely Wrist. Today, we have a very, very, very special guest, the godmother of watches <laughs> herself, Miss Kelly Osh. I actually don't know where that started. I, it's like, <laughs> I guess I, it's like, I guess, I guess it's better than tag. You know what I mean? Like, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. it it's a good title to have. And so funny enough, I was texting my friend and she is the store director of an IWC boutique here in Vegas. Yeah. And I, I was, she's like, oh, who are your, who are your next podcast guest? I was like, oh, guess who we have coming up? Um, and, I, and I was like, the godmother watch. She's like, Kelly? Kelly Osh? Um, and I was like, yeah. And she's like, oh, my God. I want to be like her when I grow up. Uh, um, <laughs> That's ridiculous. Like, nobody <laughs> Nobody, if you knew my life, nobody wants to be like me. Trust me when I tell you. No I'm one. Not, I'm not gonna lie. When when we when we tried to meet up when you were here in Vegas, yeah, uh, for your birthday, and my wife was at the Ed Sharon concert. Yes. And I I wanted to be you that day. No. Yes. She was <laughs> she was backstage with Ed Sharon, like hanging out. Yo, that's amazing. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm not sure if we Ed, edit, um, edit Ed has been so if Ed's 32, he has been collecting watches, and I have helped him on that journey since he was 20. Wow, that's awesome! I, I've seen that he's got a pretty extensive uh, collection as well. He's got some piece uniques and things like that as well, which is pretty cool. He's a he's actually a very smart collector. I could tell. I I when I saw his one of one Patek, like with his like local you know home there instead of like london i was like wow that's so sick and um i like partner up with other youtubers and like every once in a while like we'll do giveaways and so i was just feeling super generous one day but um i gave away a g-shock of choice and the person came back to me and said i want the subtract tour watch and so <laughs> they literally just posted a picture of it like today like thanks blake like you're the man. Like, I just got this. That's and cool. It, it just kind of comes full circle, you know. Um, but, no, I was so, totally jealous. And I, I was telling my wife, because she was there, I was like, the lady that's coming on the podcast is backstage for Ed Sheeran right now. Like, that's so cool. You know? <laughs> she gets uh, Ed Sheeran's music and to talk about his watches. Like, that's the best of both worlds that Kelly's got. <laughs> yeah. Um, Again, yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about collectors that are smart. Um, and collectors that are, you know, very thoughtful when they're when they're making selections and they're not geared towards one thing. Because yeah. the the most boring aspect of this entire industry right now is the fact that every single person wants the same exact stuff. I agree. I, I you know, I got to be honest with you. I've never, you know, coming back into the industry in 2020 and being multi branded again. I genuinely thought I was going to have such a great time and, you know, and I am, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's weekly that I question myself because it's, it's every day. It's the same thing. And even as a kid, like I was never one to go with trends. I mean, I mean, look at me. I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a trendy person. I, you know, I, I truly believe, and I post it all the time. It's a hashtag that I use all the time. It's be you, not them, you know, because honest to God, I, I don't know what it's like to walk around and want the same exact stuff that every single person wants. Yeah. Like, why would you want that? I don't get it. Some people do people, you know, have the, uh, I don't know what you want to call that, the sheep mentality, where they see something that works and then they want to try and make it work for them. Uh, Sad. For, yeah, from my perspective, in terms of watch collecting as well, I feel like that's pretty bland. Uh, I like to it's, diversify personally and get things that are different as well. Like, um, where does the emotion come in anymore? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, s social media has been such a great thing and such a detrimental thing. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, the great thing is the exposure, obviously. So reaching out to young guys that maybe are, and I say guys just because 
let's face it, 90% of my business is still men. You know what I mean? It's just kind of the way it is, you know? But reaching out to young guys and, and women that are looking to start collecting and, and still yourself relevant. Like that's really important, you know? And that's important, I think, in any industry that you that you are in. Um, but to the detriment, it's kind of like, oh, look. 912 people have posted a Submariner today. <laughs> Need to throw my sub away. <laughs> She's falling asleep. So. <laughs> I mean, it's like, how, you know, like, you know, and if, if you have a Submariner for a reason, like if it was something that was in your family and it was passed down to you, or you genuinely just love a Submariner, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But to not take a price point now, because, you know, they're not cheap. You know, Submariner is 10 2. And I only I only use that because that's the price I remember today. You know what I mean? But it's like, it's literally, it's $10,200. $10,000 is a lot of money. It is. So, like, why wouldn't you want to expand your horizons and actually look at everything that's $10,000 and make a decision that's right for you and not for the masses? It just... Yeah. To me, it doesn't make any sense. I think, and I have a unique perspective on this because watches, you know, like originally they came out as time telling instruments, right? But then people have lost the identity of what a watch is really supposed to be because then it became like a status symbol, right? Yeah. Like, oh, like if I'm in business with this person and he's wearing uh, a, 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 a day date, you know, I know he's successful and he's successful and Correct. we'll have a successful business, yada, yada. So watches have kind of shifted from being a useful tool to like a status symbol. And yeah. and now people associate that status, like that's just where it is now in general. So like with, with Instagram and, and hype culture coming full mm -hmm. circle, like everybody's like, you know, a 5712, right? Like yeah. everybody wants a 5712 because the 5711s are gone you know, and now the 5811s are impossible. So like, oh, okay, yeah. let's find a little middle ground, you know? Um, but, you know, just it's just hype circle, hype culture coming full circle. And every day, and yeah, I, I, I bought a sub, be, not because I really wanted a sub, but because I got offered a sub and I was like, okay, this is the most, one of the most iconic watches in history, arguably, right? And I got offered one, so I'm like, shh, you know. Um, but I also wanted to do it differently. I didn't want to buy just the the black sub, you know. I wanted to buy, like, a unique – I feel like the Starbucks is more unique, and that's the one that I have. Okay. You know, the green bezel. Okay. So I, I was like, I want to do sub, but I want to do it a little bit more unique. And then I, I do like a sub, but um, – And again, there's nothing wrong with liking a of sub. Of course, yeah. You know, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with it, but – you know, and again, that's, you know, that's the first, you know, thing that popped to mind. But, the you know, the fact is, it's, it's really, I mean, what does everybody ask for? Everyone asks for a Daytona. Right. That's, I yeah. mean, you know, so I should probably give the sub a break, you know, Definitely. <laughs> like, you know, it's really, it's really, you know, a white face Daytona is what every Tom, Dick, Harry and Bob, you know, are asking for when they walk into your store, you know, so. I'm at your store right now. <laughs> as you can that see. Is, I, I love the fact that you guys have that as a background. I'm in a living room somewhere in a cabin, hopefully not talking to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, what store are you at? No, I, I chose this <laughs> lovely living room. It could be mine. Who knows? We don't know. <laughs> That's the headquarters. <laughs> I'm in headquarters. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure which store I'm at, but hey, it's watches of Switzerland. So look at that. Look, there's Rolex as well. It's quite glass. Beautiful. He can't decide. It's quite beautiful. It looks great. It he looks great. And actually, you know what? That is our uh, American Dream store. That's where I was today, Justin. Oh. And uh, Blake, yeah, you're in you're in um in Soho. I'm Very in Soho fitting. Via Las Vegas. <laughs> um I'm really glad to have you on. Obviously, we've been going back and forth. For quite a long time, trying to figure out scheduling. Thank you for taking the time to sit down with us and to of chat. Course. Um, should we do? Are we always do a wrist check. I know that's kind of cliche. It's okay. But I, I definitely want to see what you're wearing on your wrist. <laughs> so, um, 
I, you know, I know you guys follow me. Um, so, you know, I'm a huge Grand Seiko fan. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So I am wearing my, um, from the Elegance collection. Hold on a second. <laughs> Put it up in front of your, uh, in front of your body. It'll be a little easier. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So, um, you know, Maggie Lee Wound, Power Reserve. Um, this comes on a bracelet. I customize um, any strap that I wear is never a company strap. I always customize um, even down to the buckle sometimes. I believe that watches are very personal. So for me, um, every strap that I do is very, very personal, very customized. That's the best I respect way to do that. It. Yeah. yeah. I am wearing a Pam 1084. Great watch. I love it. Before the price increase, I got it. Before the price <laughs> increase. Yeah, I've just got you know, a... We can say that literally about everything. Oh. Is, is, is that a Hamilton? No, it's a Laco. It's a floating watch. <laughs> <laughs> Justin has left the Yes, building. it is a Laco. Okay. Yeah. See, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. The underdog. I, there's a funny story about that watch. I got it and i was like i don't wear this and justin was here for a convention um and i was like dude just just take this i said no i don't want it please don't give it to me <laughs> <laughs> and i you know i mean it's like i picked it up i got it i don't even know how much i paid for it and then when when i left um or when i'm sorry when justin left my wife was like did you give justin that watch and i was like yeah yeah she's like what she's like what the hell why and i'm like I think I got it for like 90 bucks or something like secondhand. It's like a $300 watch secondhand. I mean, you know, I, I, I just, even, I, I just I wear it whenever he boys. sees me so I can impress him. And then I just throw it every time I get off camera. So, you know? so no question <laughs> for you guys then, um, because I find myself doing it all the time. Do you guys, because you are, you know, such, you know, you're, you're passionate about time pieces. Do you find yourself giving them as gifts a lot? I try to <laughs> not me personally, because my collection isn't as stint as extensive as Blake's, uh, but he's pretty good for that. <laughs> but like even so, but, but even if, if it's a fun Timex or if it's a swatch or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's what I find myself doing that a lot because, um, you know, I think it's valuable from $50 to 500,000. Like, my goal is to have a watch on every single person's wrist. You know what yeah. I mean? To, to respect time, to respect craftsmanship, no matter, you know, what it's made of or, or whatever the case may be. I mean, it's what I do for a living, but I, I thoroughly enjoy giving a young child, for example, a watch. Sparking you know? that interest, especially at an early age. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter brand or anything. It just, anything. It doesn't. That can, I think it's, I think it's a really that fun thing to do and you know just a, a little fun fact um swatch and um i think you guys know that i'm a i'm a huge swatch collector i have over a hundred and some swatches but swatch actually the the line flick flack yeah um i didn't know this but flick and flack are actual characters hmm. and so swatch what they do is they put together a box it's adorable. And they put a book about Flick and Flack. And then right next to it, they package the, the Flick Flack watch. Oh, wow. And, and together, this, this costs like 60 bucks. And I now, it is my standard gift for a child, even if it's like a baby's first birthday, because... It, I always, always believed in giving educational gifts to children because yeah. they grow out of clothes, they That's grow right. out of, you know what I mean? Like, but if you give some, them something to help the parent, you know, educate the child like books or, you know, a toy that shows them how to tell time, you know, a puzzle or something like that. I always think that's so beneficial. Plus it makes you feel good too. But this um, Swatch is doing something really, really great. And it's just, so, it's a, something you, sh you guys should know. Cause I, I only found this out this year and I bought like six of them because I think that oh. they're really great gifts. I didn't know that. I, I have yeah. heard of, 
click flack before and obviously um my so my my friend just purchased a few for his children but i can't say that i'm in the situation enough to purchase watches for for people um it's it's really hard because i you guys aren't well you guys aren't old enough yet either right i don't (laughs) think i don't i don't have a lot of like my family is really scattered so i don't really get a chance to see my family very regularly um good for you good for you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and for for whatever reason, like I might be the last generation of my family in a weird sense because none of my siblings like have children. I don't have children. I'm me not neither. Sure, you know where where that's going. Um, me and but, my brother, no kids. Mm-hmm. It, it's I don't know. It's weird that we're at a time in our life and generation, right? Like culturally, where it's like it's kind of taboo to have children in a way, you know that sounds so weird. You know, to like procreate, it's like, okay, well, should we? You know, like, yeah. And I've know. always said, why are you breeding? Like, I know. ew, like, like who? <laughs> I know you're gross. Like, what the heck? I have seven kids. No, I'm I'm just kidding. I don't have any kids either. <laughs> He's a Mormon. He's a Mormon. <laughs> Right, right. Whatever, that's fine. Yeah, it's like, he's got you. Do you? It's totally fine. <laughs> seven wives and seven children. <laughs> let's let's jump into this. We've we've had some some banter here. Um, but t- tell us. I know you were at Tiffany for a while, but tell us how you got into like watches, just in general. So. Um coming out of college, both my ex-husband and I had radio, television, and film degrees. So my ex-husband is in radio and I was in the TV portion. And um, I was a producer, in fact, and I was doing really well in the the city of Philadelphia. And um, my ex-husband was more successful. And he still, to this day, is very, very successful. He works for iHeartRadio. And um, we did five moves in three years because of his job. So each time we moved, I couldn't get a job because every production house wanted me to start at the bottom. And I had come out of college, you know, I graduated cum laude. I had the best internship. I was already a producer and my ego wouldn't allow me to start from the bottom every single goddamn time. I moved to a different city. I just couldn't do it. But what was keeping us both afloat was the fact that I've always sold. (laughs) I've always been in retail ever since I was 16 years old. And um, I started to feel really bad about myself because I was like, you know, am I going to do this for the rest of my life? And my ex-husband said to me, he was the one that actually said to me, like, Kelly, this isn't a bad thing. Like this is, this is a true career. Like you happen to be really good at it. So go sell something that's going to make you happy. You know, stop, stop with these, you know, little jobs that are, you know, that you're taking here and there and you're managing a store and you're, you know, you're doing it, but like go actually sell something that is going to make you money and go sell something. I'm still waiting for the money, by the way, but you know, um, go sell something that's going to make you happy. And he's like, what makes you happy? You know, and I said, watches and jewelry. And he's like, so go sell it. And I was like, well, you know, who's going to hire me that, you know, that's, you know, that's a fine jewel. And he's like, go figure it out. And so I did. And Hamilton Jewelers in Princeton in 1997, I was the only, I was the youngest person on the floor. And I was um, uh the only person that they had hired that did not have a GIA degree. And so um, while I was there, um, Hank Siegel, who owned, you know, still owns Hamilton Jewelers, I was able to not only, you know, complete my degree, but um, they kept pushing me because I was a woman to go sell jewelry. And that's not where I was happy. I was always behind the watch cases because I I had always, even as a kid, I, I had always worn a watch always. And so, um, my grandmother kind of started that because she was one of the people remember when Swatch came into fruition, it was like, again, this is way beyond you guys, but like, you know, like a cabbage patch kid, 
you had to stand in these like awful lines at Christmas time, right? And so my grandmother stood in line for me. And that's how I got my first swatch. So swatch is very personal to me because of that. And then, um, you know, I started let, I, God forbid, I hate to say this, but I started to like the watch customers better than I did the jewelry customers. <laughs> and what, you know, what I mean by that is, is I was dealing with a lot of men. Um, men are sometimes easier to deal with. <laughs> and, you know, I was dealing with this sort of, for me. <laughs> I know, right. <laughs> And, you know, and it was like, it was this like fast paced sort of wheeling, dealing kind of mentality, you know, back in the late nineties, early two thousands. And I, I loved it. I loved working with, I had, my book was filled with car guys. You know, we had, we were surrounded with, you know, by dealerships and like these guys would come in and they want to talk watches and, you know, listen, it's, it's a fun fact, but, and you know, it's actually a study but men feel actually more comfortable buying from a woman. Then you throw in the fact that, um, you know, a woman that actually can talk technically, not bad. So my boss saw that and I worked for this gentleman named Mike Hopper. And um, to this day, he is still in the industry and I still respect him like no one's business. He's a mentor of mine. He is my second father. He is someone that um, has been with me since, you know, the beginning of my career. And he said to me, and it was kind of on a bet. And he said to me, he's like, you know, um, I think it's really, this is, back, oh, by the way, this is back when you could actually talk to employees, like, you know, like you could talk to them. Like, God forbid if this was said today, but he was like, you know, I think it's really sexy, you know, that a woman can get behind the counter and talk about a machine and and be confident and do it so you know what you're gonna run my department if you think you can do it i don't think you can but let's try and i was like yeah. oh i'm sorry did you just challenge, challenge me challenge? you know and so i was taking home catalogs every single night and just reading them cover to cover and learning each brand um you know uh basically by a book but then you know um each each brand recognized that it was pretty serious about it. So then I started to become um, trained by each and every brand, um, you know, through their levels of training. And the Patek Philippe one um, uh, in 2005, they threw a laptop at us. And this training that Patek provided was like nothing I had ever seen. It was like a college course. And, um, it kind of blossomed from there. I scored really high. Um, they took me to Geneva. And the next thing I know, I was representing Patek Philippe for the last 27 years in some sort of capacity. Um, and so, you know, the luxury lines that sort of went with Patek Philippe have, have been a passion. Now that I'm back in the industry, being multi-branded, um, I value every single brand, not just the high-end brands, because those those brands for a thousand dollars, those brands for five thousand dollars are just as important, if not more important, than the high end brands. Yeah, I mean you sell you sell a thousand of one watch, like a Hamilton or Oris or whatever, and then I mean it, the 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 economics lines up. You know, like if yeah. you look at it from the airplane industry, like the economy I think it's the the economy class, I'm not sure if it's the economy class that pays for the first class or vice versa. The first class pays for the economy class, but same principle, right? It, it is the same principle. Yes. Uh, um, and, and that, yeah, that's so funny because uh, retail's changed a lot. So I, I actually, I, and I never told you, but I used to sell watches as well. Um, Where? I started off as a watch collector. Um, and then I literally like came back from Europe. And I was uh, kind of look like in between a weird time where I wasn't sure if like my then fiance was going to come because my, my, my wife now is from Europe as well. And so we're like going through the process, like bringing her here and getting all this paperwork. And I was like, never sure if she was going to come. And, um, and so I was like, all right, let me take this job at a watch boutique here in Vegas. And we sold 30 brands. I'm not going to say on stream, but I will text you and tell you where I worked. 
Um, because we Fair. we tr we try here. I mean, to be very unbiased, like uh -huh. in, in our whole concept for for our blog and our our podcast is like we don't do paid reviews. You know, yeah. like a lot of a lot of watch bloggers will get a watch in the mail. Yeah. Um, and then they'll, they'll get paid to review it and then they'll pretty much say whatever the watch brand wants them to spit. Yep. And, and we, we don't do that. So like, I just got this watch in, I, I sit in the other room, but it's from notice. Oh yeah. Um, great brand. They are amazing. Yeah. And, and I, I told Wesley, um, he, he's going to be like a few podcasts before you. Um, but I was like, yeah, if you send us a watch, then. I'm probably going to shit on it, you know, like, I'm sorry to say, but, and he's like, dude, I love that. Just, and then he, he, he sent me a watch, um, you know, because I find it hard, especially with all these content creators. Now it's like, they're only talking about the products they sell. Yeah. Right. You know, like every watch blog to exist ever does that. Like they're yeah, not going to talk about products they don't sell because they're yeah. monetizing things. So, um, our 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 viewers pay for this by donations like we are we are viewer funded you know um so it's just people that just out of the kindness of their heart just say we like blake we like justin we like the podcast like here's money people like you guys this is great go figure <laughs> sometimes <laughs> i you know su surprisingly um and justin doesn't know this i never told him this uh -oh. but, um he came Big on. reveal, Justin. This is a huge reveal. Um, he came on as my first podcast guest, Justin. Huh? And we've been friends for a while. We got into watch collecting together. Um, and and the first podcast like blew up. Like just because I know big brands, Justin knows micro brands. Um, and and then we we just kept kind of going. And then I get more fan mail about Justin than I do about me. <laughs> he doesn't know that. But every every time, <laughs> and my wife <laughs> is the podcast editor. My wife's been editing podcasts for a long time. Okay. Um, and she goes, every single episode, she's like, God, Justin is so good at podcasting. And I'm like, well, what about me? Like, she's like, well, you're all right, I guess, you know, but. but it's because. I just sit here and look pretty and I just let you take the wheel, you know, that's easy. <laughs> yeah. Yo, so, man, Justin, that's hard. <laughs> I'm dragging him along for the journey. Um, that's right. <laughs> and, and yeah, we got into watches together and, and yeah, so it, it's always been our, our passion and our dream to do something with watches. Um, and yeah, this is really the only way that we could think about doing it. You know, like I, I didn't like selling watches. You know, there's so much politics in selling watches, um, especially when it comes to like allocations and, and dude, it's horrible. Who decides what? And it's horrible going through these little politics and like what you can it's and can't awful. say. And mm -hmm. I got to a point where I was lying to people. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not a liar. Like I this this like affects the way I sleep at night. Like, yeah, what I say and what I don't say, you know, yeah. Um, one of the one of the things that speaking of that and it's 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 so true one of the things that i have found so hard is the fact that i've told the truth you know um i've run a business very honestly my whole career and you know there have come times when there are certain people that you almost don't have a choice but to be just bold and honest and those are the people that are always going to hate me and you know never have any kind of respect for me but like dude you can't walk into a business okay of any kind whether i'm selling ketchup white t-shirts or ferraris okay and actually think with your sense of entitlement that you deserve that's a word that i absolutely just erase it from your vocabulary none of us deserve anything okay 
we, you know, it, it, how you get something is why don't you just try to be a human being and have a conversation, you know, then this, do you know who I am baloney? Like, yeah, you know, you attract, what's the, what's the saying? Like you attract flies with honey, not vinegar or whatever the case may be. Like what, whatever that saying is, I think you get my point, but like to literally demand, expect, and use the word deserve. Who do you think you are? Yeah. It's awful. <laughs> yep. And then you're the one that it turns out to be the bad guy because you said no. And it's like, but did you go to the did you go to the Ferrari dealership? Because they run their business the same way. You know what I mean? Like you, you can't just walk in and buy a pista. Yeah. You know, like it's it's just that's not gonna happen. You know what I mean? So you know, Patek was, and I, again, I refer to Patek, you know what I mean? Just because that's what I've spent most of my years doing. But I mean, it, it, it's, it's simple. Do you have a relationship? You know, have you, have you bought something else? Because to come in here and demand, 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 demand a piece that I'm going to get four of. And even just to use the grammar that you're using, I mean, Come on, man. It's just, that's not realistic, you yeah. know? I And so, I, you know. I had a different approach. So when I came in to, to watch sales, and this is advice for any salesperson ever, mm-hmm. especially in the watch industry. Um, when I came in, I was just a watch nerd already. So right. I was like, everybody on the internet who likes watches and who's a watch nerd, they suck. If they're on the internet, they're tr- like they're trolls, like super hard. Like mm-hmm. they don't give a shit about you. They don't care about you. Like you're you're a douchebag. You know, like every collector is is weird. It's a weird space to be a watch collector on the internet. And so every other collector on the internet was just super weird, super douchey. Like you just can't meet genuine connections through the internet as a watch no. watch guy for some reason. No. But I was like, all right, look, if I go to this boutique and work there and I see watch nerds like in real, like real life watch nerds, like I'm going to make friends, you know, like I'm new to Vegas. And so So, my perspective every single time was whenever a customer walked through the door, right? I I shouldn't even say customer. Like whenever somebody walked through the door, I wanted to make friends with that person, you know? And, and my, my other colleagues were like looking at this as if, as if like they were like had a, a piece of bait and they were trying to catch a fish, you know? Correct. And I, I literally, the, I, I could not look at it like that. Like, and that probably had a lot to do with my success where I yeah. was like, I mean, I was per- outperforming a lot of my colleagues, you know, who had been there, you know, um, a lot longer. And I was like, look, you know, I, I told them, they're like, why do you, why do you, why do you do your presentations this way? Like, why do you talk like this? I'm like, well, first of all, if I'm here to make friends and then I sell a watch secondly, that is the long game, right? If I make a friendship with this person, they're going to be loyal to me. Any, any watch they buy in the future, they're going to text me first. And, and I never really like, I never really understood it like that until I, I became a sales professional. Like I just saw it happen. And that wasn't my mentality. I was like, hey, look, I just want to be friends with these people. And hopefully they buy a watch. Sales professionals, um, one of the biggest things that um, I'm always asked, you know, by no matter where I've, where I've worked, you know, Kelly, can you teach um, the other sales professionals what you do? And the answer is no. You either have it or you don't. And you can teach the fundamentals of how to clientele, Right. You can, you know, you take the names, you take the addresses, you take the phone numbers, you know, you do the thing, you know, you get a, an item in that you think that customer is going to like, you contact them. Okay. Fundamentals, fundamentals, but they're not taking the time to realize that there's actually, like you said, a long game. There is a long game. You know what I mean? You shouldn't be thinking about tomorrow. You should actually be thinking about six months from now, a year from now, because it's, it's not, you know, the immediate sale is what, you know, keeps the money flowing each paycheck. 
And those are going to happen. You know what I mean? If you work in a, a situation like a Watches of Switzerland, because we're blessed to carry so many brands, you know, you're going to have that, that guy or that gal walk in that needs a gift, that needs, that's looking to reward themselves, that, you know, um, just got bonus and maybe is thinking ahead. You know, that's going to keep the bread and butter on the table. But the fact is, you know, what's going to keep your pocket lined for years to come? And it's the long game. It's the relationship. It's how you treat that customer if they're just in the mall to say hello. It's you know, it's crazy. And I, I I never really understood this until I obviously joined, you know, like the industry from your perspective. But I started thinking back about like what creates a successful experience, right? Yeah. And an example is whenever I'd go to my dentist no matter who was at the front desk and whenever I walked in, they'd say, Oh, welcome Blake. Like I've never seen you before and you know who I am. And I was like, Holy shit. That's powerful. You know, it is like just the small things. So whenever I was, you know, clienteling, like we call it, you know, they give you a little card and I just be like, yep. I'd write down everything I could remember about our conversation. You know, exactly. their, kids, their kids' names, what type of car they had, where they went to school, yeah. like, and that's where I'd start. Like, oh, yeah. like, what brings you in? You know, oh, no, like, where are you from? Like, I see you got an NC State shirt on. Are you from North Carolina? Oh, like, like bro, this is not rocket science. I know. It's yeah. It's you right. And it's people about being more complicated. It's about being personable too. And me and Blake have a had human. this conversation. Yeah, yeah, just just being personable, being genuine. Um, and that's yep. one of the best ways that you can honestly be a salesperson. And that's, you know, no change for watches as well. I, um, I hated that on my business card. When they printed <laughs> my business card and it said sales professional, I was like, I, I don't want this title. Yeah. People this professional. Is shitty, this is a <laughs> shitty title. Like, can I just be like a watch nerd or like a a, a brand expert or something? Like, it just says what? friend. Yeah, friendly <laughs> watch guy. Um, Your pal. Ev yeah. Eventually, eventually, when you do that and you and you're like, hey, I'm just here to to talk to you. I'm not here to yeah. talk about. Eventually, they're just like, dude, like, shut up. And I'm here to look at Omegas. You know what I mean? Right. Like, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you, Blake. Um, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> no, it, it, it's so funny because I I left a while ago, like the 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 retailer, and I still talk to the people every day. Mm -hmm. I still talk to those guys that are buying watches. And my friend was in Japan, and he's like, Blake, I'm trying to get a Grand Seiko from Japan. Like, what would you recommend? Yeah. And I was like, dude, you can't go wrong with any Grand Seiko. But I'm I'm getting people that are texting me. Like, what do you think? Is this a good deal? Is it a bad deal? Like, what do you think about this watch? Like, and I would even tell my friends, customers, um, like, even if you're buying a watch somewhere else, like, let me know what I can do. Like, if if, if right. you need a watch nerd to talk this over through, or if you need a reason to buy it or not buy it, I can give you either of those reasons. Well, you're genuinely interested in them. Exactly. So, if you know, if the watch buying experience has to do with them, you're genuinely interested because they've become part of your life in some way, shape or form. And right. There's, there's something powerful about connecting something, somebody with something that they love. Yeah. You know what I mean? Agreed. Really passionate about. Mm -hmm. And and that's the most rewarding thing. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Would, would I want to go out in a public space and talk about cooking or would I want to talk about watches? I'll probably pick watches and that's probably what I'm going to be <laughs> most interested in. So it's, it's cool that you can kind of harness that and then, you know, Meanwhile, I'm like, help your customers through your passion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's like both. <laughs> um, but I kind of moving on to the next question for you, Kelly. Um, while we're kind of on this subject, uh, what defines a successful customer interaction for you? It's it's um it's I call it because I was taught this. It's the me factor. And what that means actually is, and, and Blake, you, you just described it, that client, that friend, that customer, whatever you are calling them, that guest literally trusts you so much that they will call you 
for anything, you know? And so, um, uh, Hey Kelly, you know, my, I know you don't carry this, but my granddaughter's graduating from college and, um, I really want to buy her something special on a handbag. And I loved what you had the other day. Like, could you suggest something like that? I want to spend 1500 bucks. That means that they trust me for literally every factor in their life. And so it, 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 there's no better compliment than trust. You know, they, they, they trust you. They know you're at least going to tell them the truth. Yeah. I mean, you know, very harshly, I will tell you the truth. Same. That's either a welcome or it's like, oh, don't ask Kelly because she's actually going to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, I know what I mean? <laughs> I've, I've told, so, I've, I've you lost. know, to me, that's that's the most successful um, interaction I can have. The fact that three hours later, 30 days later, three years later, they're like, you know what? I'm going to call Kelly and ask her. There, there was no real that's measuring cool. stick for me. Because yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've lost a sale because there's no way to measure this because I told somebody to not buy that watch. Yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah, da, 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 da. Like, I read about this. I'm, Dude, don't buy that watch. Like, why would you say that? Like, how many you know, reasons do you want? Well, you the know? last, I mean, the last 10 years of my career um, is when we really started to talk about, and this word makes me, like, crumble. When, when people started using the word investment, oh God. you know, and I'm like, if you, first of all, if you're buying these things for an investment, we shouldn't be even talking, you know, because it, it, it's just, that's not, I don't have a finance degree. <laughs> I, I can barely add, subtract, multiply and divide. Okay. <laughs> so right there, if you've come to me for an investment purpose, we're not going to have any more of this conversation because I can't. So what's this going to work be worth when I walk out the door? And I'm like, what, you know, but, but these that. are questions that have always, you know, been thrown at me, especially, you know, selling Tiffany stamps, but oh what's God. this worth? I'm like, you know what? We, we live in a, in a very powerful world now where you can literally pick up that cell phone and Google anything that you want, but don't ask me because that's, that's not how I'm here to sell. I'm here to build a collection with you. I'm here to represent the brand appropriately. I'm here to represent myself appropriately, you know, but we're not going to sit and talk about the, the financial gain that you're possibly going to have when you walk out the door. That's people, not how you buy watches. People do that. And, like, and those people that do, you go ahead. I'm not your person. That's people, why there are many people, I but I'm not like your person. 70% of the people that come into the store like look at it from that frame of mind. Like it's insane. It's like, okay, if I buy this now. When I leave this store, what's it gonna be worth? It's right. True. And you know, they're looking at Kono 24, they're looking at eBay, like, you know, what's the used value? It's like it's the same thing as the car industry. Yeah. You yeah. know, a lot of times when you buy a watch and you walk out of the door, it's not worth what you just paid for it. No. Sadly. Sadly. That's not the reason why you're supposed to buy the watch in the first place. Like no. Now, you know, the, the collections that I have that I've built with gentlemen that are millions and millions and millions of dollars. Okay. You know, that's sort of a different frame of mind because we're talking about things that are, let's say, tens of millions. Okay. And, you know, are they if they're sitting in front of me and they're they're looking at let's say a five hundred thousand dollar Patek, they're looking at a five hundred thousand dollar Jacob and Co. <laughs> okay. You know, <laughs> listen, I'm pulling brands out of my butt right now. Okay, but like, you know, am am I going to I'm going to lean to the Patek <laughs> for several so. reasons? But that's not to knock Jacob and Co. Of course, you know course. I'm I'm not a, a like a covered in stone type of watch gal. I never have been. I don't really own many things with diamonds. You know, if I'm going to wear jewelry, I'm going to wear jewelry. That's that's how I actually look at it, right? So you know, it's 
it's one of those things where, you know, I am also going to be honest. So if someone's going to put me on the line and say, Kelly, should I buy this or this? And we're talking about half a million dollars. I'm going to be honest, you know, but if we're talking about like, again, a grand Seiko versus a tag lawyer, I'm literally going to be like, you know what? I'm invested in grand Seiko because I love the brand. I think it's, you know, one of the most amazing things that you can buy under $10,000, you know, but I, you know, a tag lawyer was my first luxury watch. So, I mean, you know, it's like, you, you know, you have to, you have to really be comfortable in your own self and not many people are, they're not comfortable in their own skin. So making these purchases, they, they ask for guidance, but you know, it's, it first and foremost, you sort of have to be comfortable with your own self and your own money flow. And, you know, know that, you know, if you're going to blow $500,000 on this, but you honest to God, love it so much. Buy it. You know what I mean? Like, but, you know, it's, it's so, it's so interesting because I started, you know, so much with a passion for watches. And now it's like, I have to be careful with some of these gentlemen that are building these collections of millions and millions and millions of dollars. Cause I'm like, I wouldn't buy that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I wouldn't buy that, but like, you love it. More power okay. to you. <laughs> you just put a, you just put a hot turd on your wrist. <laughs> no i i literally think about this too like as a collector and i have 85 watches okay like i have more than most people i was talking to adrian from luxury bazaar the other day and he was like dude you have 85 watches i, I never i don't talk really too much about that um he's like dude you have more watches than almost anybody who i know and i'm like yeah i guess i don't know but you know, I, I found, and I, I, I'm an advocate now for people not having 85 watches. Like, I literally talk about, like, getting, like, a three watch or a five watch or maybe a 10 watch collection, like, because there's no possible, I mean, look at what happened. I saw Justin get his watch because I didn't wear it, right? So, yeah, there's no possible way for you to wear all these watches. Like, you're going to gravitate pieces you love, and there's going to be pieces that, that just simplify, that, that just make it short in your collection. But True. as a collector, like one thing I've noticed is like you go in, right? And you're looking at the same watch. It's like you're building a house, right? And your house is your collection and you're buying the same material over yeah. it. Like you're buying a part of the roof, a part of the roof, or you're buying the part of the foundation, however you want to spin the analogy on it. Like you're buying a sub and you're buying a Panerai, then you're buying a 50 Fathoms and then you're buying an Aqua Terra and then you're buying, you know, it's like, then you're buying a Pelagos and then it's like, okay, like you just bought the same watch over and over <laughs> and over. You're like, oh, I guess I like a certain look. Okay, that's fine. You're allowed to. <laughs> you are, you are. But then you think about it, like, how do you, how do you implement this watch? Like that, yeah. that's where I, I made the mistake early. Like, how am I going to use this watch? When am I going to wear it? Like, and then you, you start thinking about, you go into a watch shop and you're like, oh, like, I, you think about the watch that's on your wrist and not the watches that are back at home, yeah. you know, like you think you don't think about like, here's the gaps, right? Like, okay, I'm building that house. Like what pieces of my house are missing? You know, do I need this piece or that piece? Like, and then my wife the other day, we were like, where's this going? Like, where's my collection journey? Like, I have no idea. Like, I don't think anybody can answer that, but I went on current 24 and, and made my dream list of watches just like, the, if I had these, I don't know how many watches is maybe 12 or 15. Like okay. I would never, ever buy another watch. Are you sure and about I, that? I don't know. Maybe. No, maybe not. <laughs> um, I did but, that too one time, <laughs> but you have to long game, right? Looking, looking ahead, you know, th that's how you survive in this industry or die. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'm, I'm curious as well. So obviously you're the, I'm not sure of your official title, but it's, it's director of customer relations. That's is that director of client relations for watches, the Switzerland group. Yeah. Client relations. Um, something that I think is probably challenging. So obviously watches Switzerland is like the largest retailer and of, of watches in the world. Probably. I'm not sure where you fall on the spectrum of that side of things, but 
how do you ensure okay okay so is that is that bukerer down there or is that no okay. i was talking about me personally <laughs> okay okay i was talk, i thought you were talking about the other big boys you know what i mean um no we're up there no we're up there <laughs> um how, how how does how do you bring that consistency from new york to vegas to are you are you just the u.s do you are you responsible for global or u.s okay so how, how do you bring all that same how do you how do you consistently bring that across and distribute that ideology you know of of you know being honest and being transparent and creating a unique experience like how do you how do you communicate that to everybody and i will say this is for from my record and nobody i've never said this and i would never say this publicly except for to you and for here and for today and for right now but every single boutique i've ever been into except for watches of switzerland people people are people are scared at watches of switzerland it seems like to cross that border from like okay this is a customer okay this is a friend they're scared to be friends with me for some reason i don't know if it's because i'm a podcast or because i'm a watch nerd or whatever but they're scared to cross that threshold it's being part of a publicly trained or uh, publicly traded company so that means they can't make friends with watch it is um we Hot try seat. our hardest to maintain a very professional um, front. I think that most people don't know how to combine both. So if you're going to choose, you choose the more professional sort of stance. And... Um, I was hired because literally watches in Switzerland was like, how does she do that? Huh? Did she just tell that customer that he was stupid and slap him? <laughs> she did. And yet he's writing the check for $200,000. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, so it's, it is something that we're genuinely try, trying to sort of break through in all of our, you know, showrooms. Um, in New York, it is a little different. There is a much more laid back vibe. Much more. Um, Soho has really got it down pat. Where you're sitting, Blake. <laughs> in the Soho store. <laughs> I'm in your lounge. Um, Hudson Yards, um, again, I think does it well, um, but it's hard when you're a publicly traded company and you have as many employees as we do. Um, there are there are gems in every store. You know, in Vegas, um, we have. Um, you know, a, a young lady, for example, that has just broken those barriers and has really, Bruno? really genuinely, she's so personable that, you know, when we even had all of our GPHG stuff going on in New York, I requested to have her sent in because she's, she's that good. But again, trying to clone you know, myself or, you know, this young lady that I'm speaking of, or this, this great gentleman that we have in Soho trying to clone them is, is really hard. You're talking about Bruno. It... <laughs> Justin and I both know Bruno. Yeah. She's listening right now, actually, probably. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's really, really hard. And I'm, I'm trying my best. Yeah. Um, watches like obviously, I mean, obviously, watches have took you and connected you with amazing people in yes. this world. Um, how how do you feel like the watch industry attracts like minded people to each other compared to any other industry? I think we have some, we have some hard questions. 
Yeah, want the, you do. I want, the, um, I want the juice. Give us the juice. And do a backflip. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Should have drank at lunch then, I guess, right? Oh. Uh. No, we, we are very <laughs> mindset focused. You know, we're not product focused. Like, yeah. and we talk about it, and somebody's asked me, and they put this perspective. I prefer that. Yeah, like our podcast is not, it's not very, I mean, we're technical, right? To a degree. But if you look at and listen to every other podcast, it's more like a founder's podcast, a creative yeah. podcast, and then watches are the the meat and potatoes. Right. Because we have- we, we, we have, you know, you, Kelly, you know, as a guest coming on here, you know, as a, as a colleague, as a friend, um, mm-hmm. we want to get to know you and our listeners and, and watchers. You know, we want to be more personable with the people that we bring in here. So we, uh, you know, we try and ask some pretty tough questions sometimes. And if you want to pass, that's okay. <laughs> we listen to all of your public statements and we ask the exact opposite. <laughs> so ask the question again. So obviously watches are amazing and it brings a lot of like-minded people together. Yeah. Um, but why do you think watches and no other hobby scene industry attracts collectors in the way that watches does? Why do you think that is? I disagree with you. Okay. Maybe cars and guns too. Sorry. No, so <laughs> Yeah, I know. Right. It's, I can't be part of that club because I, I, I can't have a weapon in my hand. It's just, we were, it's we just were, like... <laughs> we were joking, me and my friends, and um, obviously Formula One's coming next week, and yeah. all my all my friends are here coming, yeah. and I'm hosting them. But if you want to sell a watch, go to a gun show or a car show, you know? Well, see, that's what I was going to say. So so, so cars, um, I have a really big client of mine that lives in Vegas, and he's a car guy. And all of his friends, all of his personal friends are in the automotive industry. I think that, you know, um, collecting is passion. Passion brings people together. So, you know, I know a guy that's really into wine. Okay. And he collects at a very, very high level. And his best friend, that's how they met. They met at an auction together. You know, so I think that, um, we all work really hard for our money, right? So you work, you work really hard you, and, and you like to play hard, right? So when you play hard, those are the people that you're normally going to connect to immediately because they're sharing the same sort of um, downtime, you know, and downtime is when we let our guards down and we're really our own self, you know? Now I, you know, I'm black and white. I, I, there's, I'm not gray. Okay. So in my work life and in my fun life, my, my downtime, I'm the same person, but there are not, you know, these guys that have to, to have these, you know, really high end finance jobs, they have to be on in a different way. So, you know, when they're taking their, you know, and that's, listen, pardon my French, but I call it FU money. Okay. If they're going to take their FU money and they're going to spend it with me, then I need to give them my time. Right. And I need to give them um, the experience that they expect because they could take that money and blow it on a car. They could take it and blow it on vacations. They could take it and blow it on anything they want, but they're, they're taking the time to actually have a conversation with me, have an experience with me and buy something from me. Not watches in Switzerland, me. I take my job very seriously. And so I truly believe that they're buying the watch from me. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's, I I do find though, when I start to talk to them about their best friends that they bring to me as a referral or something like that, how did they meet? They met at their, at their pastime. So I think if anything luxury, I think it's anything or, you know, cars or wine or cigars, for example. Oh man, I know guys that have a cigar club that absolutely, all of those guys are each other's rider guys, you know? And so it, it really, it really, it's, it's, I think anything that you kind of spend your downtime on because you're relaxed, you're your real self. So I think that's what attracts each other. 
you know, towards like friendships, that. towards, you know, relationships, um, because you're sharing a passion together. I like that. I, I've also thought about that too. Like I'm, I'm personally not really a, a huge car guy. I'm into cars. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm a guy. We all are, whether we all like it or not, but, um, yeah. I've always thought, I'm like, man, why are car guys like so into watches too? And I'm like, put my hand on the steering wheel and I'm like, Oh, Hey, mechanics. there's my watch. Oh, <laughs> but mechanics feel it evokes emotion. It does. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, never, you never see a mechanic like a legit car mechanic with a watch, though. Kind of no. weird. <laughs> so weird. You don't want to get your wrist stuck in anything. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's just because they understand how these technical things work, I guess. I don't know. And they're just like, that's the last thing I want on my wrist. Technical True. engineering, you know. That's right. It's like a fail and then have to get fixed, you know. Yeah. True. Um, I'm going to ask you this, Kelly, because I don't think that we talked about this yet. Uh, what's your favorite watch in your collection? We jump around a lot. Yeah. If you had to pick one, <laughs> if there was one watch, it, it doesn't matter about price or anything. What is your favorite watch? It literally changes all the time. <laughs> I wish I had that problem. <laughs> Obviously there's watches you'd never sell, but yes. right. If there was okay. a watch that only you appreciated in your collection, and we, we've joked around, and, and Justin asked me this before, and so we've asked every single person this, if this watch were to be taken with you to the grave because you love it so much and you want to rot forever in it, <laughs> sorry to be gory there and grim, but... I... um. So the first thing that I bought myself, like with cash, meaning I didn't win it. I didn't get a good deal on it. Like I didn't, you know, the first thing that I bought myself was a two-tone Pasha Chrono. And I can't part with that because it was um, purchased for a reason. So I had just gotten divorced. I was 30 years old. I felt like a failure, like a failure. Cause I, you know, I married young and, um, I couldn't make this marriage work. And I, I had hit sort of rock bottom and this watch, I took my divorce money and I spent it the wrong way. And that watch actually is really important to me because I look at it every time I wear it and I think to myself, this is when you hit rock bottom. And I had to file for bankruptcy and I had to sell other things in order to eat, in order to pay rent. And I wouldn't let this watch go because it reminds me every day where I came from. That's the reason why you buy watches. Yeah. That's right. So many a time I thought to myself, as I got older, I'm like, I got to let this thing go because why do I want to be reminded? Why wouldn't I? Because you, you, you have to know where you came from in order to move forward. And so I, my joke, even in my thirties and my forties, my joke was always, if I could teach a college course on how to completely screw up your life and come back, I would probably have the most well-attended class in the college because I did. I made all of the wrong mistakes, all of them. And you know what? It, it's made me the tough bitch that I am. <laughs> it's also made me the, the, the most humble person. Because humility gets you very, very far in life. And as much as we, you know, laughed and joked about the title when, when you guys opened the podcast, um, as much as we can laugh about it, it shows that I've been doing this for 27, almost 28 years. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I may be in different facets of this industry. You know, who knows where I'm going to be in a year? 
two years, five years, 10 years. But I guarantee it'll probably be this industry. <laughs> you don't know. You know what I mean? But I'm not going anywhere. I, I love this too much. But, you know, it's it's really, really interesting to me when people sort of forget their past. I like to remind myself every time where I came from. Because I didn't ask for help. I did it myself. And I think that's really important, not only for a human being, but it's very important for a woman. We we t joked, and this was just a joke and a, a talk. Um, <clears throat> do you know uh, Jose Perestroika, Periscope? I know the name, yes. Okay, he was on our podcast. And this, uh, my friend from the IWC boutique, um, she brought this up. And I totally forgot we had this conversation, but ironically... We talked about having a Carfax for watches. Like it's a total joke, but it makes so much sense. Like, like I like I took this watch to XYZ. These are the moments that I like nobody documents that. Like, here's no. the moments that I've cherished with this watch. It's true. Nobody's ever documented that. Like, okay, I took my Panerai to Isbiza or uh, you know, I got I got engaged in this watch yeah. or, or, or da, da, like, cause, cause I know like all the moments that I've had with this watch, but it's never been documented. You, you have an excellent point. And we, we joked about that because like, like I'm sure there's a watch out there that belonged to, to John Lennon or like to maybe Ed Sharon that, sure. that he sold or was passed around that somebody has it and doesn't know it belonged to them. True. There's it's, probably, a good, it's a good point. I like it. There's probably millions of watches that are out there that have that same backstory. Like it was passed through and, you know, John Lennon's son got it and then he needed money for this or what, who knows, whatever. Or he passed it to his son and they Agreed. didn't tell his son how important it was. And and so having a way to, to document that was what we mm -hmm. talked about in our podcast. And it's funny because every time I talk to a watch collector, like it seems like this needs to happen more and more and more because that could affect the value right like if if this i don't know like who knows right like if i got the second pre-owned and it belonged to tom brady or something like don't you think christie's would be like hey let me get tom brady's panerai to auction and of course i would say no but besides the point same <laughs> that affects the value of the watch you have I was not like, that, that, that watch is not worth shit. I, I know. <laughs> not that that's important because we just literally had a huge rant on how watches and, and value is. is it's no, not, I agree with you. I agree. It, it It's not in this world. Like it's another figment fairy tale. Yeah. Um, but, but how great would that be? Be fun. It would be awesome. And then to have pictures kind of like a, like a, like a Facebook profile for your watch. You're like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> People do it for their dogs. That's true. All yeah. right. Okay. True. Now you just touch the very sensitive subject. <laughs> Palmer definitely has his own page. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See, you do it with things you love, right? You true. archive the moments that are important to you with the things that you love. And that is how you take pictures. It's very true. It is. It's very true. You're right. You're right. Sorry, I just had to make a funny thing because okay, totally for, Justin, totally... let's mark this day and time. Blake was right. We, we just, what are we all wearing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are we talking about too? Um, yeah. what the and this is kind of again us springboarding because we do that. Um, if you. I, I, as a sales professional, found myself showing the same watch over and over and over. Yeah. Not because I thought somebody else would like it, but because I loved it. Yeah. Like, okay, here's a watch. I, I know every single function. I know every single complication. I tell I, every salesperson to do that. And, 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 and I know the backstory of this watch. And, and for me, that watch was the Seamaster 300 Heritage. Because I knew that that was like released in the 50s. It was Omega's like mm -hmm. first shot at the dive watch. It started from the Seamaster 120 and went up and they increased their water. It's like 
there's so much important to me. Like I could, I could literally like sell, but I could never sell the watch. I knew everything about the watch, but nobody seemed to want to buy it. So that's funny for me. It was um, when I was at the Patek Philippe salon, it was a 5196P. 5196 you know what that is? P. I'm going to look it up. So it's a manually wound Calatrava hey. Breguet numerals. Um, time only. Absolutely stunning. That and every time stunning. someone asks me for a Nautilus or an Aqua, I'm like, have you seen this? Because the reason you haven't seen it is because you're caught up in hype. But if they knew what it was when they walked in, that meant that they were they cared about the the lineage and the history of the brand. For for Mr. Summers, uh, it kind of reminds me of the Baltic, uh, the MR01. Yeah, the Mister. Yep. <laughs> the Mister O1. Um, yeah. It does. Yeah, it is. It is a, it's beautiful, a beautiful watch. watch. Yeah. yeah. And it looks like it's all platinum. Is they only make it platinum? Yes. It was so it was platinum. It had a closed case back. And again, you know, when Patek Philippe um, started to give um, collections a name. So, for example, in the eighties is when you know the Calatrava collection was the Calatrava collection. And the Aquanaut collection and the, you know, and the complications, grand complications. But I mean, you know, you hearken back, by the way, I'm bringing back the word hearken, by the way. I decided <laughs> that's it. I brought, second time using the word. Okay. You, you said hearken back. With your Grand Seiko on, document it. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you look back seriously at Patek Philippe's lineage, the reference 96. That's it. End of story. If you've learned anything today, please, <laughs> please Google reference 96. And that is Patek Philippe's lineage. I'm going to follow this watch on Chrono 24 and watch the second we drop this podcast, the value just boop. You know, again, if, if you call yourself a Patek Philippe collector, and because remember, people love to give themselves titles, okay? If you call yourself a Patek Philippe collector and you don't know, the lineage of Patek Philippe and how, you know, it came to fruition and what watches were integral to the, to the growth and, and, you know, the success of Patek Philippe, then you're not a collector because if I'm going to be a collector of something, I'm going to know everything about the brand or everything about, you know, um, my passion back to when it was formed. Now, I'm not saying you have to like it, but I'm saying you have to know what it is, at least, if you're going to call yourself a collector. You know, are you are you a Porsche collector if you only like and know one car? No. No. You know, so it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's ironic because people that love to call themselves collectors don't actually know anything about what's in their collection. I agree with that. Probably me too. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. watch watch brands that I have done you dirty. <laughs> yeah, it's always my um, favorite. I'm a collector. Are you? <laughs> Probably. I'm not. curious, Kelly. <laughs> I'm curious which which brand do you guys sell the most of within watches of Switzerland? Besides Rolex, that's like a given. But like, <laughs> what do you think the next is? <laughs> oh well, you know the top three, you know dollars and cents wise. I mean, it, you know, that's sort of, that's obvious because you're looking at price points that are, that are really, you know, extraordinary. So, I mean, you know, you're looking at the Patek Philippe's and the Cartier's and, you know, whatever, um, you know, we own um, Breitling Boutiques, we own Omega Boutiques. So, go, I mean. Let's go by units because that's probably. Yeah, those better, are, those are yeah. just sort of the obvious ones because we own those boutiques. So. We do very well. We do very well with Oris and we do very well with Grand Seiko. Again, we own a boutique. Um, we do very well. I mean, we do great with brands that are here and the brands that are here. I mean, we're we're a beast, you know, when it comes to um, volume just because we, we sell it all. You know, and it's funny because when you read a report, 
you know, I, and I hate reports. I can't read them. I, I, I'm the worst. Like, you do not want me in your office because I can't do anything. I'm like, you know, like my, my girlfriend who was um, with me at Tiffany, she now runs Analog Shift next to James Lambden. Yeah. And she still to this day, like cracks up laughing. She's like, I'm sorry, did someone just tell Kelly to make a spreadsheet? <laughs> like, that'll take her seven years. You know what I'm like? Yeah, I, I can't. I can't do anything. You know, my boss, when he hired me, he's like, how are you? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no. You're hired. Great. <laughs> Got the job. You know what, Kelly? Just go back out and sell something. Okay, great. I can right. do that, right? Yeah. But, I mean, we, um, you know, now my focus in the company are the independents. So we're really building a very, very strong collection of independent brands. We have Armin Strom. We have Arnold and Son, Angelus, um, Speak Marine. Um, um, Jacob geez, um, We have a lot. MBNF. You know, so uh, Beauvais. Moser. So, I mean, you know, we're we're doing a lot with all of these brands. So, I mean, like on a daily basis, it goes like this because it, it just depends on the week. What, cool, though. what do you feel like is the most underrated brand? We know you said you're a, a huge Grand Seiko person. We had that yeah. on our question. But what do you feel like is the most underrated brand that like – most people don't know of they've never heard of it or maybe you sell it maybe you don't but you know if you could shed a light into a dark corner and that be that watch brand what would it be because i I'd actually never heard of speak marin until you yeah. brought him in and i was like oh, like these things are sick and, and again it's not a brand for everybody you know no, what i mean like it's, it's, not. it's not just like Beauvais is not no, you know what i mean it's you know and but I love the brands that that know themselves and know their own identity and they're not going after every single customer. You know what I mean? Like I, I love I love when a brand sits down with you and they're like, we're not for everybody. And I'm like, neither am I. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. You know I mean? I'm going to acquire. Yeah, they know who they too. are. They're, they're comfortable in their own skin. You know, That's so great. I would think um, I would challenge everyone that wears, you know, a ten thousand dollar Rolex to put that away and look at other things under $10,000 that are absolute workhorses that are, you know, and so that's where the Grand Seikos of the world come in. Oris. I love Oris. I do too. I, I do. I've got three of them, you know, um, I love Oris. Um, again, a very approachable brand president, a very approachable brand you know, selling things for $2,000 that are, again, they're, you know, they're an independent, you know, they're, they're a great brand. Um, you know, Tudor, Tudor's a great watch, you know, um, I'm trying to think what we have. Uh, Doxa, I'm a big Doxa fan. Doxa's, Doxa's cool. Yeah. yeah. Big Doxa fan. I own three of those too. Three seems to be a number for me. So I own, <laughs> I own three Doxas as well. I'm like a lunatic. When I like something, I'm all in, you know? Third time's um, the charm every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Doxa is is just great. I mean, again, price point under 5K. You know, I mean, you're getting something that's like sporty, um, you know, helium release valve. You want to take diving, um, you know, uh, color. I mean, lack of better words, just color. The, the orange, I'm like, love it. <laughs> I have an orange. and Yeah, it's it, – and again – you know, if you're looking for a dive watch, the color that you're supposed to be looking for is orange because that's the color that when you go down deep, you it's, know, that's the, the color opposite. that you can... It's the yeah. opposite spectrum of what blue is. So it like contrasts. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love all of our quote unquote inexpensive brands. We have some great inexpensive brands. We had, we had that are still really good quality. And listen, we're not, we're not, um, we need to touch on more, you know? Um, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> we, had, yeah, we, had we Mike... need to touch on, on more of them. Um, you know, and there are some things in the works. 
but we, you know um that we're that we're going to add and we're going to be representing well they're coming we had mike pearson on uh i'm not sure where he's at in the the chamber but we're huge fans here of uh, of zodiac 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 is a great watch huge yeah. fans i got the um the white ceramic one from mike like oh the cool white, white and blue so, i mean yeah. it's like, that thing is sick great piece yeah and we gave him shit because it didn't have a ceramic buckle but besides the point <laughs> zodiac um is something it's funny zodiac is something that all of the red bar people in new york own <laughs> justin was at red bar yesterday and i had to call him and ask him how it was <laughs> Cause I'm not cool enough to be in red bar. <laughs> it was fun. Two out of 10. <laughs> no, if you lived in New cool. York, you would be a, a member of red bar. Yeah. I, I need to go there. What? And, uh, there there's no, there's no Vegas chapter of red bar. That's so, weird. So I have been working and this is the first time publicly announcing this. I've been working with the guys in Atlanta from the what from watch society. Yes. And we're doing it in Vegas, and I am the president of the Vegas Watch Society. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, we're we're working on our first event. And when? We've, I will let you know. I don't know. I've already Please submitted, do. I've already submitted the dates to our partner who will be hosting it. <clears throat> and I don't want to say that out loud, like who it is yet. Uh, okay. We haven't secured it, but I will text you the details um and i'm doing it with a few other people like i have all the people that i know like from from here from my sales from customer i mean it's gonna be i think it's gonna be really big um, so like honestly i would love to support you so if it's something that um if it's something that i can actually fit into my schedule i would i would love to come wow that's epic no, I would, I would, I would love to because I support all of these groups because I think that they're really important. They're important not only to um, community, but they're important to retailers as well. I mean, let's face industry. it. We, yeah, they're important we, to the industry, like big time, big we, time. So if there's something, if if it is something that I can do, I have like a couple of upcoming things, but not major. But like if it's something that I can actually do, Blake, I would love to come. Yeah, there, there's a few things I'm going to ask from you now that you offered. <laughs> um, but no, no, we we want it to, we, we don't want an application, like everybody's welcome. We want a safe, secure, like PC environment, you know, sure. um, no politics, yeah. no religion, like leave that at the door. Please. Like just watch nerds watching out, you know? And my, my strategy to grow the group has been to, to go to every sales professional that I know that I have a relationship with and be like, dude, just get your biggest customers here. Like get your biggest sure. watch nerds here. So or, obviously, or you know what, or the, the new customer that's just starting to get into it and maybe wants a connection or a friend or, you know, whatever, like, you know, that's where, you know, that's, I can tell you, exactly. like I'm always blown away when I go to the New York chapter of Red Bar, because I can't believe how tight they are. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. And they always welcome me because I can't, I can't attend every week. It's just, it's impossible for me. And even sometimes once a month, it's impossible for me. But Kathleen, who runs the New York chapter of Red Bar, is always, always reaches out to me and says, can you do this? And I'll, you know, I'm like, no, I can't. But yes, I can. No, I, you know, whatever. She's always, always so welcoming to me, to my clients, to whoever wants to come. It's important, really important. Even if you don't own a watch, like yep. you're going to be welcome. As long as you're fascinated or interested in watches, yep. the Vegas come watch share the society, passion. Yeah, it's going to be for yep. you. 100%. Yeah, no, 100%. So let me know, so, please. We appreciate that. To, um, my to pleasure. segue us. I, well, no, I do. I do. I think it's. I think it's really important. I'm excited Thank to hear you. that. Thank you. <laughs> Justin's in North Carolina, so he doesn't care. 
I got to fly out if I want to come that way. Yeah. Um, but no, to, to kind of segue us into the uh, into the next bit, um, and we're trying not to keep you too long, Kelly. I know we're approaching about an hour and a half here, so hopefully just a few more quick questions for you. Um, I, I know that we listen to this. <laughs> I know, right? We don't know. Not me. <laughs> Um, but no, I know that we were talking about, you know, some of the diver- the diversity and stuff um, within the industry. Um, why do you think that there's so little amount of females within the industry? That's um, I, something I that just... we talked a lot about. We don't understand. I don't understand. Justin and I have talked about it. I've talked about it with other female uh, pioneers. I, I, I call yeah. them pioneers if you're in this industry because it's mm-hmm. a male-dominated industry. Yeah. Like, Very much so. When, when I was at Red Bar yesterday, um, we had a turnout of probably about 90 people. It was actually a, a pretty solid little event. Um, and almost every single woman that was there was either there supporting their husband, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah. fine. Uh, but there was a, a small handful that were actually really into watches. But yeah, I my husband a question. Come to shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always got a questioning. I'm like, man, like I understand, you know, like from a, you know, gender preference and stuff and and from a jewelry perspective and things like that but i'm like man watches are like really neat like they're there's a lot of heritage to them um you know they can be very valuable they're fun to look at um it's mechanical what is it yeah like what is it that like it's mechanical we we had a um we had an almost almost an all-female store when i worked at hamilton george we had an almost all-female store in our red bank area when we had that store and my, my boss, you know, would send me every Friday night down to the shore basically to, um, <laughs> because it was literally, you know, it was, it was crowded on Friday nights. And so, nope. you know, Kelly go, go down there and teach these ladies how to sell watches. And I started laughing. They were petrified to get behind the counter. Meanwhile, you should hear these broads talk about a diamond. And I'm like, if you can talk to a diamond you can talk to a watch you know right. i mean <laughs> the, the amount of technicalities that go into light refraction and culet and table and crown angles of a diamond you know i can do that too it bores me to death like i would rather eat glass okay you know it's it's not what it excites me but it is what excites most most women yeah. Now the clarity know, and the cut and the color, and you're just like, it's, oh, it's pretty, fine, whatever. you know. Yeah, <laughs> it sparkles. But, you know, it's it's just yeah, it's just funny. And I think, um, you know, women have always just the women I worked with, for example, in the very beginning, they were just they were so afraid of being behind that counter and having a man stump them, you know. And I wasn't. Cause I would look you dead in the eye and I would say, you know, sir, I don't know. You're talking over my head, but I'll get you an answer. And they would be like, Oh, I love that. That's, that's all it when takes. you mentioned, when you mentioned humility earlier, that yeah. that's a great lesson. You know what? That's cool. If I don't know it, but you're going to show me because clearly you're interested in telling me. So I, I literally, when I worked at the watch company, um, as a watch nerd, I was the only person that came in there as a watch nerd. Like right. I didn't, I didn't care about, selling watches i didn't care about making money i know that seems so weird um because it wasn't like my nine to five like it was just like a something i did to keep my mind busy but everybody would ask me like watch collectors will come in intentionally it's such a weird thing but they'll try and like put you in a gotcha moment like tell me about tell me about this watch like tell me about this like what what movement is this and then the sales professional will kick in and go, oh, da, 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 you know, and then they're like, actually, no, actually, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And watch collectors will do that. And so I told everybody I worked with, if you ever get faced with a technical question you don't know, just say you don't know, but say you'll yep. find out. And that is the game changer. So helped my answer my answer again, you know, as, as a woman, cause you know, people wanted to do it all the time. My answer was, um, if I got cornered, sir, what do you do for a living? I'm a lawyer. Okay. So on Monday morning, 
I'm going to show up at your office and I'm going to tell you how to do law. <laughs> How's that? Well, what? No. I'm a human. You're a human. And you're coming at me. It's almost like you want me to fail. It's true. Okay. And that's not, that's not fair because I don't come to your house or to your office and treat you with disrespect. Now, if you want to teach me something about the watch that you have, man, I'm willing to learn because I like this as much as you do. But don't come at it from a very indignant point of view. Let's not do that to each other. And I, I said that one time, that very conversation, I had that very conversation because I had someone so rude and so, so like so male. He just couldn't, he couldn't get over himself. You know what I mean? And he was disgusted that there was a woman behind the Patek Philippe counter. Hmm. And I didn't know that his wife had heard the whole interaction. So he asked me where the restroom was. I told him where it was. And I sat back down at my desk and the wife came over and she said to me, my God, I am so sorry. And I'm like, about what? You know what I mean? And she's like, about that interaction. That's my husband. I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, you know, I said, honestly, I said, he got me on a really bad day. I said, but I think I was fair. I said, because I, he, and she's like, oh no. She's like, I've, she goes, I've never seen anyone. She goes, you know your stuff. And I said, this is my home. I, I was, I was chosen by Patek Philippe to be in this salon. Clearly, I know what I'm talking about. And because I didn't know the exact reference of the Submariner on his wrist, you know, I was like, Sir, that's not my specialty. Oh, well, don't you think you should know that if you're a Patek Philippe salesperson? No. Always, it's always a proving ground for some Probably. reason. Like not at all, sir. <laughs> not at all. Because I chose where I wanted to be the focus point of my attention. And I chose to I you can't come in this house and know something more than me when it comes to Patek Philippe. Don't do it. <laughs> I, trust me. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like I, you know, I was very, very confident because I had worked so hard to be there, you know, but that's my, that's my thing. Like, sir, don't, I, I'm not going to come to your, your office on Monday and tell you, for example, if how to do your job, wrong. <laughs> you know, cross-examining you on a Monday. <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> do you know, I, again, I don't come to your house and rearrange your furniture because I think it's wrong. It's your so, house. Like, like, calm down, everyone. Maybe so, we, and again, you know, as a human, let's learn from each other. It's, no, it's I'm really sorry. I don't know the, the, the exact reference number of the, you know, red dot sub you're pulling off of your wrist. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't know. I'm, forgive me. <laughs> it's really sad that we have to actually even talk about this. Like, Honestly. because th this, this happens like more than you would ever oh, it expect. Happens. And oh, it I, happens. I never knew it. Like, oh, and, yeah. then, and then I realized as a watch guy, like maybe I'm the gotcha guy, you know, like <laughs> I, but I would never, I would never call somebody out. Like yeah. I would go into like Macy's looking at a Hamilton or something and they, I would just let them talk. And then meanwhile, in my head, it's just spinning like, Dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. But you want to know something, that person behind the counter, maybe they don't. And maybe they're covering for someone. Maybe it's a bad day. Maybe, you know, we don't know. But you know what? It's There's a way of saying it. Like, Blake, you can say, actually, I, I'm familiar with this model. May I tell you something about it? There's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? And I, if I was a salesperson, I would say, yes, I'm so sorry. Like, I, you know, I don't. This isn't my specialty. I work over in jewelry and I'm covering for, you know, someone's lunch. I'm sorry, sir. I, I'm happy to answer any questions that I, I can. 
But if you know something, let's share it. Tell me. It's, and that, that, that goes back and perfectly brings back, kind of hits the home run of where we talked in the earlier the podcast. People don't care. No. Like even the watch guys, like they don't care. Like for any salespeople that are listening that sell watches for a living, and that's your nine to five main source yeah. of income, it doesn't yeah. matter about what you know about the watch. Like I think the biggest thing that it you can doesn't. do is just is just understand the customer. Yeah. And, and try and find something to f- to fill their need. Okay, what do you want to watch for? What do you have? Common like, ground. Yeah. yeah. Like like what are you hoping to add to your collection? Okay, let me show you. You know, let them get hands on with it. And then just shut up. Just shut up. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. Like don't say anything. <laughs> let them handle the watch. Let them go through the process. And then just you know, don't be rude. I mean, it's just, it's you, know, just you, know, you know what? Don't develop would, their own opinion. You know what? I question I would ask 10 out of 10 times that nobody else would ask in my in my store. What do you think? Oh, I know. Like you never hear anybody else ask that. Like I've never I, even asked that before as a watch guy. Like as a watch. I ask watch it all buyer. the time. I know. What do you think about this Omega? <clears throat> like, what do you think about this Hamilton? Or like, yeah. like, like, what do you think about the watches that are on this tray? That helps you reach that common ground too. So then you know how to continue well, forward I mean, with the conversation. <laughs> well, listen. The, I mean, it's it's selling. Also, you know, it's selling one on one. You don't ask yes or no questions. You ask open-ended questions so that you can start a conversation. You know? I see that you gravitate towards blue, sir. Tell me why. Is it just a favorite color or is it, you know, do you like the way it looks on your skin? You know what I mean? Like, it's it's just, you know, it's open-ended questions so that you can get them talking. And then you can yep. feel, you can feel it. If they don't want to talk, that's okay. Then just clerk it, you know what I mean? Because maybe they, maybe they don't want to have a conversation. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they just, maybe they came in to feel good. You know what I mean? Maybe they just came in to feel good, and that's fine too. But read the body language and read, you know, read the reactions and and actually, here's a concept. Actually, listen to what they're telling you. And remember you know, it. retain yeah. it. You know, like yeah. that is going back. You know, I would write these things. You know. Because those are important. They're like, very oh, important. I, I remember your daughter is Jane and your wife is Jennifer. And, you know, you were here visiting like for SEMA or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. And then you'd be like, oh, I remember last time, like you were here for SEMA. How's Jennifer? How's Jane? Right. Like, is Jane still at, you know, MIT or like, did she, did she graduate yet? Like, yeah. like, that's the type of shit that like people are just like. Whoa. Like, like pump the brakes here. Like, are you a stalker or are you reading my mind? <laughs> Listen, it, it it's the little things in life that Absolutely. that are so impactful. I walked into a hotel while I was in LA and I had left a 30-year-old pair of earrings on the plane. Oh my gosh. Man, I was devastated. De- I still am. I was devastated. Right. I walk into the hotel room, excuse me, into the hotel to check in. And that woman at the desk read me. And she's like, you know, ma'am, you know, is there anything else we can do for you? She's like, if you don't mind me asking, she's like, you seem upset. And I'm like, I am. It's not with you because she could read my body language, you know? And she's like, she's like, oh, I just wanted to make sure. And I told her my story and she was like, oh, and I was like, yeah, I'm like really upset. She, you know, what kind of earrings were they? Where did you buy them? We started to talk. I get up to my room. I'm not even there five minutes. And a cheese plate arrived because she wanted to just simply cheer me up. Now, what did that cost her? Nothing. A cheese plate? Nothing. A little (laughs) cheese plate, little grapes, and like, you know what I mean? And a bottle of water. Thank you. That actually made my day. Because... She cared. She cared enough to to know that I was upset. I'm in her house now. And how is she going to make the experience better? By giving me a cheese plate that probably cost them two bucks. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was, and it was that thought went a long way. And every time I go to LA, I most likely will now stay in that hotel. That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, segueing here, I've noticed, and maybe other people don't notice because I'm in Vegas, but a lot of the brands that you carry yeah. are kind of pushing away from the shop and shop experience. Like every brand wants their own boutique. Like oh, they, yeah. they don't want to be next to this brand or they don't want to be next to the, and it was so weird to, to, to see that from the, in, the inner perspective, like Omega yep. doesn't want to be next to Tudor. Like it, they just That's don't correct. like they, they were like, we're not going to be in your shop if we're going to have an empty space next to Tudor. Like we're just, yep. it, it's so weird. Yeah. Um, but with that, that trans it's, it's transitioning now, I'm sure because you just said it, you know, you guys are opening Bretling boutiques. Bretling doesn't wants their own boutiques now and IWC wants their own boutiques and now Tudor all of a sudden wants their own boutiques and Omega. Like, how do you feel like that change will impact the future customers? Okay. You know? So I'm not going to mention the brand. Of course. Okay. But I already, I already have an experience and I knew this was going to happen. And I said it and the manager of the store actually laughed with me the other day because it happened. OK, so a particular brand decided to go boutique only on many, many things. And this is a brand that is very middle of the road. OK, very like as far as price point goes, middle of the road. OK, and this brand decided to go boutique only, boutique only, boutique only with many, 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 many things in the collection. And the price point, like I said, is middle of the road. So what happened? They started opening boutiques and nobody's coming. So now they're back letting us have some of the things that we couldn't have in the past. Okay? So what what they're realizing is the brand itself is most likely not strong enough to stand on its own, but it needs that support of a retailer saying, you know what? You want to spend five to $10,000. We have many choices for you. And on this pad, I can put four watches and usually that's one of them. So it's interesting that they had decided this, but now they're starting to come back. And I'm like, mm, is it too late? Because it's we'll like, you know. We'll let you it, suffer in independence for a while here. <laughs> it's interesting. Like all of this is so interesting to me because I've been in the industry for so long. And so I've seen the ups and downs, the ups and downs. It, you know what? If I hear one more person talk about how 2024 is going to be the worst year of your life, like I'm actually, I'm actually getting sick of it. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of talking about a recession. I'm tired of talking about, you know, COVID, death coming, you know, and how it's going to be the worst year ever. I'm tired. I've lived through all of it. 2008, our market crashed. Guess what? 2009, we were back. Because we were still, you know, us, us, you know, three here on this podcast, we're middle class. We're the ones that feel it the most, right? And so if something like that happens, the rich are always rich. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're still yeah. buying. They're still collecting. They're still, you know what I mean? They're, they're you know, they're smart with their money. You know, it, it's, it's always the middle class. So us, I'm always going to have a job because we're the ones that, have to work we're gonna work and we're gonna make it happen you know what I mean? we're we're the ones that, that are the workhorses we're going to make life happen you can't that's right not have us you know what i mean that's so right. you know it, it's funny because yes i mean typically luxury products are the first to go but luxury products are also the things that make us happy yep <laughs> so in a time of distress you have that extra 500, 1500, and you're, 
and life really sucks, guess what? You're going to buy yourself something you don't need. And I'm there for it. <laughs> you know? How, how, um, how do you decide which brands uh, to carry within the market? Like, I think... Um... That, is, that is definitely higher than me. <laughs> but, but, um, I am very blessed to be part of the conversation lately because um, when I believe in something, I sell it. And so um, I, I love Arnold and son, for example. Mm -hmm. And we just, we added Arnold and son. I've sold five of them and wow. it, it's, be, and it's because I love them because I, I want to put them in front of collectors. Listen, they're doing, they, if you love a moon phase, you have to love an Arnold and Son. Their Luna Magna, their their Moon Phase watches. I mean, they're beautiful. Yeah. They're beautiful. They also have a skeleton watch on a strap less than twenty thousand dollars. That's absolutely stunning. It's paper wow. thin. It's beautiful. You know, they you know they do it on a bracelet as well. They do it in rose gold on a strap. It's beautiful. So, you know. I challenge again all of these gentlemen that are, you know, the 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 Patek, the APs, and the Vacheron people of the world that can't get their product anymore. It's time to look at something different. Let's do that. You don't like have to that. like it, but let me show it to you. You know, because <laughs> if I love it, maybe you'll love it too. <laughs> I I actually wrote this question, and the only reason why I wrote it is because when I look at Watch of Switzerland on online, and I see all the brands you carry. And like, I think about like my store, my watch in Switzerland, and I'm like, oh, wow, that's a real big miss. Like, and what I say is like, why don't you have Nomos? Like in this Love store? Nomos. Like, like, why is, why is Nomos not in, I don't even think um, you guys have, uh, have Cartier in that store. In Vegas? Yeah. No, we don't. Miss. You know, so I wrote that. But question. that might have, but the, but but there's also licensing, and there's also Cartier may have a rule because they have a big, they have a salon. Yeah. We may not be allowed. You know what I mean? Like there's listen. There's nineteen thousand rules. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, for sure. I can tell you, Nomos doesn't have a a, a boutique though. Nomos is something that we carry online. Um. And we have also, I think we put it in, I think it's going into Boston. Boston also has Tiso. Um, and I think that all of our high-end branded stores like Vegas, I firmly believe they need something at a very beginning uh, price point. Because when you're in Vegas and you're happy, you're also buying gifts. I think that's what Tudor is them like tutor is their happy entry brand um, i think they could do better i i, I think so too yeah like you know like even rado like would be a great addition like long jeans right guys, long jeans um does ridiculously well long jeans is amazing in our it, it does really really well with the asian client and it does really well in Boston, in our casino, uh, in the wind in Boston, because it has a really, really huge um, Asian base of clients. And I mean, that's just the truth. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, it's, it is the truth. Um, and also, you know, with, with casino dollars, like, you know, let's say you're walking out with 3000 casino dollars, then you know what? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm that person. I'd love to buy myself a, a, like a little token. I'm on vacation. I'm having a great time. It's a moment. I won. I'd like to buy myself something. Or it's there, usually always a watch. <laughs> are there any specific brands that you guys hope to carry in the future that you just don't yet? Like any, just, just on a, on a corporate level. We're working on a few. No spoilers. No, I can't. No, I I uh, know every yeah, every I can't. 
every time we've had a podcast, our our guest has always dropped a little a little nugget, smidge, a little <laughs> smidgy smidge. Um, so I guess your smidgy smidge is something's coming. It's coming. You guys know the brand ID? I do. I was looking up. I was looking at your collection right now, and another brand that I love that you carry, Resence. Amazing. We have that in Plano. Bring it to Vegas, baby. Ooh. Good watch. Interesting it's watch. Amazing brand. It's an like, interesting brand. And it is. No, nobody knows about them, really. Like, even watch guys. That's like, true, actually. It's sad, you know? Like, and and yeah, that's a, that's a watch that I hope to add to my collection at some point. Like, a Type 3? Like, oh my god. You know? Jesus. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think I'm going to ask you the last one, if that's okay, Kelly. This is the uh, last I got for you today. Sure. Um, but, you know, where do you see watches of Switzerland heading within the next decade or so? Um, you know, kind of looking towards the future and how the company is shaping out. You know, I'm not a spokesperson for our company. And I can't be because of, again, being a publicly traded company. So if I say anything, it's it's just, it's my hopes. It's my personal of course, hopes. Not on the record, but yeah. right. you're, you're dreaming here, right? We're not, this is not, you don't have to reveal any contractual information. Exactly. This exactly. Is, if exactly. Kelly had a dream and that dream was in the direction of Washington, Switzerland, what would it be? You know, I, I would love to see us in the United States sort of stay where we are um, and really hone our skills on um, making ourselves a destination that wows people, that really, you know, surprises people and really hone in on some of these brands that no one knows. I always want to be the first person to carry something really interesting. Um, in the United States, for example, that's why I mentioned ID. ID is just a thousand percent sustainable, you know, watch company. And if you read anything about it, I encourage everyone to read, you know, everything about it because the direction that they're going is exactly where I'd love to see the earth. You know what I mean? Quite frankly, yep. as far as recyclable materials, uh, how they package, um, how they even get the watches to the state, like on a boat, you know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's you know, I mean, honest to God, it, it is a fascinating brand um, that we are 100% behind. And I'd love to see us do more things like that, really support the brands that, that need our assistance um, and all over the map, you know, as far as price points. I just want to be that destination where, you know, no matter what you have in your pocket, we're going to welcome you with open arms, a smile, a conversation, and get a watch on your wrist. Le Leonardo puts them on his yacht and drives them across the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I'm joking, and Kelly knows what I'm talking about, but Leonardo DiCaprio invested in ID. That's pretty yeah. cool. But he's also all... I mean, very much about, he always has been about sustainability. Um, sustainability. Yep. Like him, hate him. I mean, as an actor, he's one of my favorites. He's the um, you know, in fact, I was watching movies on the plane and I was like, you know, I haven't watched a good Leo movie in a while. And I just watched Shutter Island um, Great movie. <laughs> on the plane. Fantastic movie. Great movie, right? So, I mean, um, but honestly, he is, he's someone that, you know, <clears throat> that really believes in the cause. And so he invested in it. You know what I mean? Like, listen, I wish I had the money to actually invest in, in causes because you know what I mean? Like, I, for example, I love animals more than I do humans most of the time. You know what I mean? So, you know, if I was, if I was out there to save every dog in the world, I probably would be doing that. You know what I mean? So, um, so honestly, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where um, we, we want to be a part of anything that's, 
got an initiative like that because we want to support them the best that we can. Um, that's a watch brand that I think is really going to take off. Especially to people that maybe have never been interested in watches before. So we might be getting, it's, it's a brand like that, that we're, you're getting someone in the door that may never walk in the door because it's not their bag. It's not their thing. It's not their jam, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, so this is, this is a brand that um, I think will actually attract some people that have never thought about wearing a watch before. Under 25 bikini models. Got it. <laughs> Supermodels. Sorry, Leo. <laughs> but no, let's. Uh, Are they buying watches? I don't really care. I mean, that's. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I'm sure he'll make it happen. That's fine. Um, that's fine. <laughs> this, this turned it. We, we try and typically shoot for around an hour and some change, but obviously, we don't want to like pull back on people's personality. Like, we don't want to. So, we love you, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> you had the double podcast because you're double the personality. I'm sorry. No, no. It is a fantastic I, thing. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> we surprisingly have a lot of people that listen all the way through. It's so weird. Like we would expect a lot of drop off. You know, like I, I had somebody that was like, "Hey, like, why don't you do a thirty minute, forty five minute podcast?" Like most people just listen to like commute. We have a lot of people that hang in there. So that's I beautiful. Think, I think that's yours beautiful. Is that you guys be, are doing it right. I think yeah. you guys are going to be a hang in there pod. You're going to be a hang in there podcast. So I hope so. Yeah. And we appreciate you. Thanks for all the information and, you know, all of your responses. Um, I mean, we couldn't have done this without you clearly, but you know, it was great talking with you. Thank you so much um, for coming on. It's Final my words. pleasure. Um, and let me know your date. I will. Absolutely. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, everybody. And thanks for listening. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.